We're going to be continuing our study of the book of Acts, but before you go to the book of Acts, I'm, uh, I think everyone has already turned there, before you go to the book of Acts, I would like us to look at some passages in the Old Testament to kind of prepare the way for our text in Acts. Please first turn to, to the book of Numbers and chapter 11. Our context, of course, is Moses leading the people through the wilderness toward the promised land. We are at about 1,500 B.C. Uh, and as Moses leads the people through the wilderness, you know that they keep complaining all the time. And so this is the record of another complaining session. Let's start reading in verse 4. Numbers chapter 11 verse 4. It says, Now the mixed multitude we, uh, who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now the manna was like coriander seed and it's color like the color of bdellium. I have no idea what that is. The people went about and gathered it, ground it in millstones or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans and made cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. The people are complaining about food because they're sick and tired of eating manna. Okay? Now, they're in the wilderness. It's desert around them and God has graciously given them food from heaven. He sends the manna from heaven down to them and they can eat as much as they want every day but they have it for breakfast, they have it for lunch, they have it for dinner, they try and do everything they can with the manna and they're just sick and tired of eating manna. <coughs> I'm reminded of Stavrula. You know Stavrula's grandparents every time we go see them they give us fruit and vegetables and stuff like that and uh, months ago and I guess in the winter months they, uh, they would give us oranges and you know that I do not eat oranges and so we would come home with a bag full of oranges and some of them would have a couple and then the next week they'd give us another bag of oranges and then we would have like this pile of oranges and Savrila was making orange juice and orange cake and orange muffins and orange pies and she was like I don't know what to do with all the oranges and so that's kind of what these people are doing with the manna we've tried to do everything we can with the manna but we're just sick and tired of eating manna now they could have gone to God and asked in a different spirit in a different manna but they're just complaining they complain complain of course they go and go to, uh, to, uh, to God, so they go to Moses, who is his representative, and they complain to him. And here's the problem. They say, we wish we were back in Egypt. That's, a, that's not good. You were slaves in Egypt. Now, like, if only we were back in Egypt, because there we had a bigger variety of food. So, verse 10, it says, Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? And you have laid the burden of all these people on me. He says to God, Why have you done this to me? There's thousands of people. And every time someone has a problem, they come to me. Verse 12. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom, as a guardian carries a nursing child, to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone, because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I had found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. He says, I just can't handle dealing with so many people. It's impossible. Every time someone has a problem, they come to me. And so God says, okay, verse 16, So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men 
of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. God says, okay, you're not going to bear this burden alone. I'm going to take the spirit that I've given to you, and I'm going to apply it to these other 70 men. And you can all share the responsibilities together. Um, within, in the next verses, we don't have to look at everything. In the next verse, God says, and go tell the people, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'm going to give you so much meat, it's going to come out your nostrils. We don't need to get into all of that, but jump down to verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the seventy elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. So the spirit is now given... The same kind of spirit that has been given to Moses is now given to this group of 70. So that they will be empowered and enabled to do the work of God, to, to, admin, to do this administration work. And the sign that the spirit had come upon them was that they began to prophesy. They started declaring the word of God. Now, look what happens in verse 26. But two men had remained in the camp... The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. So you got, you got two men who are supposed to be in the group of 70, but for some reason they have not gone to the tabernacle, they're still in the camp. Now before you start speaking evil of these people and saying, why didn't they go when they should have gone, we don't, we're not giving the information why they didn't go. For all we know, the message went out and they didn't get it. Okay? We have no idea why they did not go to the tabernacle, but for whatever reason they're still back in the camp, and the Spirit of God finds them, and they stop prophesying also. Okay, just two random people in the camp, and they start prophesying. So verse 27 says, And a young man ran and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Joshua gets really upset. Yeah, so he says to Moses, you've got to tell them to stop this. It's not right. You can't just have random people prophesying. You're our leader. You're the prophet. You know, this is the group that's supposed to be doing it. And what's up with these two people up on their own prophesying? It's not right. This shouldn't be. And so Moses answers in verse 29. And Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Listen to these words. Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Moses says, I wish everyone was like me. I wish everyone had the Spirit to the measure that I have it. You see, in the Old Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit upon believers was to a much lesser degree than it is today. Of course the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. We read about Him working right here. Of course the Holy Spirit worked in the lives of all believers. I, I, I cannot fathom a person coming to faith in God without the work of the Holy Spirit regenerating Him. Of course that is going to happen. But, only on rare occasions did the Holy Spirit come in a great measure upon a person and give him great power. We see this sometimes with the prophets, or we see it with some priests, or we see it with the judges. There are very rare occasions where God comes in power, the Spirit is poured out on a certain individual in the Old Testament, and then he prophesies, or he goes and he does a great work for God. But that was not common for all the people of God. That was for very specific individuals. 
rarely in the Old Testament. Okay, like for Moses or for these 70. It wasn't for everyone in the camp, but it was for these 70. So keep that concept in mind. Okay? Now I'd like you to please move to the book of Joel and chapter 2. Now Joel, um, we don't know exactly when he lived. There's a lot of debate as to the time. Probably 8th or 7th century BC, but we, we don't know for sure. And as with most prophets, um, Joel's book has a certain outline, which is similar to most prophets. Um, he speaks of judgment coming upon the Judah and Jerusalem because of their sins, because they have turned from God. But of course, he also says that there is a day coming in which God will bring salvation, in which God will restore his people. Okay? So, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Joel, he has talked about judgment upon Judah, and he has talked about how there will be um, salvation if they repent. And at the end of chapter 2, there's this amazing prophecy. Let's go through it together. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. He says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. He is saying there is a day coming. Now this is hundreds of years before Christ. And he is saying there's a day coming. There is a new age coming in which God is going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. The Spirit is not going to be given in small amounts here and there as it has been in the Old Testament, but rather it's going to be poured out. There's going to be a downpour. It's going to be like a flood of the Spirit, not just little drops here and there as he did in the Old Testament. And you will see that by people prophesying, and dreaming dreams, seeing visions, and so forth. And he says that the Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. Now, this does not mean that the Spirit is going to fall on animals, because they have flesh too. Nor does it mean that it's going to fall on every single individual in the world. If we read the context, we can figure out what he means when he says, all flesh. Look at verse 28. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What's his point? It's not only going to be on men. It's going to be on women also. There is no distinction of gender when it comes to the spirit being poured out. Then he says, your, son, uh, your old men... And your young men shall see visions. So the Spirit is not going to be dependent upon your age. Whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. The Spirit is going to be on all ages. Then it says even on men servants and maid servants. We're talking about slaves. And so the Spirit is not going to be poured out dependent upon your social status. Whether you are old or young, man or woman, slave or free, doesn't matter. The Spirit is going to be poured out on all kinds of people. That's the point when it says all flesh. There's no restrictions like that for how the Spirit works. The Spirit is going to be poured out on all kinds of flesh, not just priests or prophets like he did in the Old Testament, but now it doesn't matter who you are. As long as you belong to God, the Spirit is going to fall on all. So there's this new age coming Joel says, in which all of God's people, not just a select few, all of God's people will have all they need from the Spirit of God. All of God's people will have what they need, will be equipped for the ministry of God. Not just a certain select few. Okay? That's the prophecy. Now, keep on reading just a little bit. Verse 30, he says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, 
The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not going to get into everything that it talks about here. We, we will talk about it in, in a few minutes. But uh, here's what I want you to get. He says, first of all, there's a day coming. Spirit is going to be poured out on, on all flesh. Then we're, it says we're going to see signs and wonders and all kinds of stuff. And then after those things is coming the day of the Lord. The day of His wrath. The day of His judgment. Where He will separate the sheep from the goats. And so how are we to escape this coming judgment? Now he says first there's going to be the Spirit coming and uh, signs and wonders and things like that. After that there's going to be the day of the Lord. So how do we escape this coming judgment? Verse 32, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you escape it. Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh, Jehovah. That's what is said here. Okay? So, keeping all that in mind, keeping in mind how the Spirit worked in the Old Testament, and this prophecy in Joel, about one day things are going to be different, now let's turn to our main text. It's a short text in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Let me remind you of our context. Last week we saw that 120 disciples were all gathered together, and there was a great sound from heaven, like wind coming down and tongues of fire, tongues as of fire came and sat on each one of them and they all started speaking in different languages and the people in Jerusalem who were from different countries had been raised and born in different countries heard these languages and they heard the disciples speaking in all these languages that they had not been taught before and they were astonished. They heard them speaking the, the great works of God. And so in verse 12 of Acts chapter 2, this is the end of what we looked at last week. So at verse 12 it says, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? So they see all these people speaking in different languages, and they say, what does this mean? This is a critical question, because that's what Peter is going to answer. What does this mean? What is this? that we're looking at right now. Of course, verse 13 says, others mocking said that they were full of new wine. Some people said, oh, they're just drunk. Now, in our text today, Peter is going to take the lead and he is going to stand up in front of all these people and he is going to explain what's going on. And let me make a quick side note here. Right here, we have one of the greatest sermons that have ever been preached. At the end of this sermon, 3,000 people get saved. Okay? <laughs> That's a good job right there. So, um, or ordinarily, um, I don't like breaking up sections. Ordinarily, I like taking a full section and going, going with it because I don't want to miss the forest for the trees. But in this case, I'm going to have to break down Peter's sermon into a few lessons because it's just so important. We can't just rush through it. Um, but I will do my best over the next couple of weeks as we go through Peter's sermon to keep the continuity in the context so that we know what's going on. But for today, let's just look at a few verses, which is the introduction to his sermon. He's answering the question, what is this? What's going on? And all these people drunk. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. I do find it interesting how you have good old cowardly Peter, who a month and a half ago was approached by a young a little slave girl. Weren't you with Jesus? No, never met him before in my life. And now he is standing up in front of a huge crowd, which could be hostile. Remember, these, it's very possible that a lot of these people are the same people who cried, crucify him, crucify him, not too long ago. And he stands up in front of everyone and says, everyone listen to me. I got something to say. Alright. Verse 15. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. 
Jews counted the hours starting at 6 o'clock in the morning, so third hour would be 9 o'clock. So we're, he says, these people are not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And you may say, well, that's not a very good argument, because I've seen drunk people in the morning. Well, you don't live in Israel 2,000 years ago. Um, at that time, they did not eat meals early in the morning, let alone drink wine early in the morning, let alone on a feast day, because this is the day of Pentecost. And Peter is basically saying, this is not just one random person being drunk. He's saying, Are you really, do you really think that 120 people, 120 God-fearing people, all drunk as a skunk at 9 o'clock in the morning? I don't think so. That's not what's going on. But well, what is this? Here it is. Verse 16. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. And my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, you remember Joel? This is it. This is what Joel talked about. He talked about a day coming when the Spirit was going to be poured out. This is it. They're not drunk. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is being poured out upon all who belong to God. What did we read last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? We were all baptized into one Spirit. We have been immersed in the Spirit. Now, all of God's people are involved in the ministry of God, not just a specific few. And I need to make, uh, I need to really get this across because in verse 16, Peter says, This is that which was spoken by Joel. Now, the reason I have to emphasize this is because you will not believe how often I have read books and articles and heard sermons, people saying, Well, this is not what was spoken by Joel. <laughs> And you'll say, what? Peter says, this, what you're seeing today, the day of Pentecost, is what was spoken by Joel. And he gives you the quote. And so many people say, no, this is, this is not a fulfillment of what Joel said, because none of these things fit with what happened on the day of Pentecost, is their argument. And so I have to go through this. Um, first of all, they say, well, look in verse 17. It says, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. And they say, these aren't the last days. The day, the day of Pentecost was not the last days. The last day is at the end of the world. So this can't be a fulfillment of what happened on the day of Pentecost. False. If you go through the scriptures, numerous times you read the apostles speaking of the days in which they live as the last days. Days. Hebrews chapter 1, you don't have to go there. Hebrews chapter 1 says, God, who in, pa in the past spoke in, at various times and in various ways to our fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul is talking about the Old Testament, about the old ancient days, and he said, what we read in the Old Testament, that was for our edification, that was for us to learn, that was for us, unto whom the ends of the ages have come. Let me give you one last one, because I could go on. First uh, John chapter 2. John says, little children, it is the last hour. And you have heard that the Antichrist is going to come. Well, I'm telling you that there already are already many Antichrists. And therefore, we know that it is the last hour. And you're thinking, what's going on here? Were they wrong? Did they think it, they were in the last days, but they weren't? No. What they understood 
is that we, they, have entered the final phase, the lost days of God's redemptive work. You had the ancient days in the Old Testament who were looking forward to this new age, this new messianic time, and Christ came, and the Spirit has come, and we have now entered into the lost days. We're not looking for some other phase that is going to come forth and something else is going to happen. We are in the lost days right now. Now, I am sure the apostles did not, were not thinking that the lost days would last as long as they have. <laughs> that they would go on for 2,000 years. But they knew that we were in the lost period of human history. And we today are in the lost days. And we are awaiting. Christ has gone to heaven and he is seated on his throne, and he is making his enemies his footstool, and the last enemy to be conquered will be death, and that is when he is going to return on the last day. But now, this entire period is called the last days. There are people who come and say to me, do you think we're in the last days? And I say, yes. Really? Well, yes, but we've been in the last days for 2,000 years, and they could go for another 5,000, I don't know. So when Peter says, this is it, this is what Joel talked about, that Joel said that this was going to happen in the last days, and this is it, it did. The day of Pentecost was the beginning of the last days. Second argument that they bring, and they say, well this can't be a fulfillment of Pentecost. They say, because here it says that the Spirit of God is going to go on all flesh. That means that every single individual in the world. No, it doesn't, and we've already dealt with that. When it says all flesh, it means all kinds of flesh. Men, women, rich, poor, young, old, it doesn't matter. That's what it means. Thirdly, and I know some of you may disagree on me on this, but something to think about. Thirdly, they argue, well, this cannot be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost because it also talks about blood and fire and smoke and the sun and the moon turning to blood and all kinds of stuff. And we know that did not happen on the day of Pentecost. Well, Peter says this is that which was spoken by Joel. Is it or isn't it? Something to think about. Is it or isn't it? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. The Old Testament prophets spoke in figurative, symbolic, hyperbolic language all the time. All the time. Let me give you a couple of examples. Isaiah 13. Isaiah is talking about the fall of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians. Okay? And as he's describing the fall of Babylon, out of nowhere, he says, and the sun and the moon and the stars are going to fall from heaven. And you're like, what? We know historically that Babylon fell in the 6th century BC to the Medes and the Persians. So how can that be? Isaiah is using figurative language. It is world-ending language applied to the fall of Babylon. Why? We have a pic it, it is symbolic language of a great destruction, of a picture of upheaval in world events. It is we have the greatest empire in the world, the Babylonian Empire, that fell in a day, in a day, to the Persians. What it's saying is the world system is going to change. Babylon is out, Persia is in. When it speaks of all these world sun and moon stars falling from the sky, it is simply trying to use extreme language to convey a world-changing event. It's not actually the end of the world. Let me give you one other one. In the book of Haggai, Haggai says there's a day coming when God is going to shake the heavens and the earth and he's going to shake the seas and he's going to shake the lands and he's going to shake all nations. And you're like, whoa, what is this about? Is this the end of the world? No. The book of Hebrews tells us that that happened, all that shaking happened when Christ came. And he says, what was the point? The point was to indicate that with all the shaking, spiritually speaking, with all the shaking that has happened, all those things that can be shaken have been removed, and the only thing that cannot be shaken remains, and that is the kingdom of God to which we become part of when we have faith. 
And so you see, this kind of language is used for world-changing events. It is symbolic language. And so you will say to me, but Nico, here it talks about blood and fire and smoke and the sun and the moon turning to blood. It sounds like the end of the world. Yes. On the day of Pentecost, it was the end of the world as they knew it. Chew on that for a while. Think about that. It was the end of the world as they knew it. The Old Testament world was over. We have entered a new age. The New Testament times. Okay? God is satisfied. The sacrifice of Christ has been accepted. All the sacrifices are over. Um, the veil has been torn. The temple is over. The people of God are now His temple. We don't have priests anymore because all His people are His priests. It is a new world. It is a different covenant. It is a different situation altogether. A whole, everything has been, all old things have passed away. All things have become new. This is symbolic language of a world changing event. And there has never been a greater change in the history of the world than happened on the day of Pentecost. When we, the old covenant was over and the new covenant has begun. Scripture teaches that from the day of Pentecost on, all believers have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and are able to, it, uh, to be ministers to God and to one another. Scripture says that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, all of us. Romans 12 says we should give our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. You see, Scripture teaches that now all believers are priests to God, to offer sacrifices of our lives and our works to God, to be able to proclaim the word of God to the world. And most Christians, evangelicals, don't believe this. They don't believe this. You have people who, here's the extent of their worship. They say, you know what, maybe if I feel like it sometimes on Sunday morning I'll go to church. I'll sit there, sing a couple of songs, watch the one-man show, and that's the extent of my worship. That's not the work of a priest. That is not the work of a prophet of God. And when people say, well, that's the extent of my worship, one hour on Sunday morning, they're denying what happened at Pentecost. They're denying the giving of the Holy Spirit to all of his people so all of his people can minister in one function or another we all have different gifts it's not the same gifts but it's the same spirit that has been given to all of us for the good of his church when someone goes off on his own and does his own thing that is not being who God has called Christians to be and that is what began on the day of Pentecost let me close let me close by saying this you have the people who said, what does this mean? And Paul says, well, this means that God has given His Spirit to His people. Has poured out His Spirit on all His people. Okay. That means, catch, catch the sequence now. Since the Spirit has been poured out, that means that we have entered the last days. And if the last days have come, that means that we are rapidly getting closer to the day of the Lord. Because Joel said, first you're going to have this, then after that you're going to have the day of the Lord. So, the Spirit has come, we are in the last days, and we are reaching the day of the Lord, which means judgment is getting closer. So, what should we do? What does He urge us to do? And those listening, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. And then we will see last, next week how Peter then goes on after he has said call upon the name of the Lord he goes on to explain to them who this Lord is that they need to call upon and the Lord is Christ. We'll talk about all that next week. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.